Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Reimagined on ThinkTech Hawaii. This show was conceived because we're living in a world of uncertainty and facing massive disruptions to our labor markets due to automation and now COVID. On Hawaii Reimagined, I feature innovators and entrepreneurs, both locally and globally, who are providing workforce innovation solutions that will make a positive social impact in people's lives and in our communities. Our focus in this show will be to learn what these innovators are doing so we can have inspired conversations about what Hawaii's economy and the future of work might look like as we emerge from the effects of these disruptions. I'm Ruby Menon, your host. And as we're trying to find our way in the world of work, I help people navigate career transitions in my career Get It Done Mastermind community. You can learn more at brainsmartdesign.com. So for today, I'd like to welcome my guest, Chaz Williams. He is the executive director of WorkNet, an innovative nonprofit that provides preparation and transition services for people who are re-entering their communities from prison. His agency trains inmates in developing cognitive behavior skills and how to do a self-directed job search. WorkNet also provides job placement services to help their clients obtain their ID documents, get a driver's license, create their resume, find employment, secure housing, and other reentry services that they need to make a successful transition back to their communities. His agency was humming along to help many inmates transition, and then COVID happened. So we'll talk about what inspired him to create WorkNet to provide services for the prison population, how he pivoted his nonprofit to continue serving clients during COVID, what community efforts are needed to help ex-offenders find jobs, and full disclosure, Chaz is also my husband. So Chaz, I'm so happy that you're here to tell us the story about WorkNet and the much needed assistance that you're providing to formerly incarcerated people so they can re-enter their community. So I'd like to dive right in and I'd like for you to tell a little bit uh, about uh, your background, uh, what led you to what you're doing now what inspired you to create WorkNet to provide these much needed services for the prison population? Well, thank you so much for inviting me and actually getting me on Ruby. I appreciate it very much. And uh, I can tell you it's a thrill to be here just to uh, inform the public and inform people who are watching what we do. My own inspiration, I started uh, as a student here at UH many, many years ago. And I have a BA from UH in a field called Urban Problems, which at the time I was there, I was able to create uh, amalgamating uh, material and uh, learning from psychology, from economics, and from sociology. And even at that time, my ambition was to be a, kind of a social service manager, I, I, I would say. And I didn't know quite what, but I, that's what I vaguely felt I should be doing. Uh, when I was getting my uh, undergraduate uh, degree. Now, in the meantime, what's happened for me, fortunately, in my career, my first job here was as the director of Hala Kipa, uh, when Hala Kipa was inside the rectory over at the Episcopal Church on Baritania. Uh, okay. It's certainly grown into a very large organization now, so I'm very happy to have been part of that. But I worked for the government after that in the city, and I grew actually tired of it very quickly. Uh, well, I guess not too quickly because I was there for 10 years. And after that, I started my own company to serve as a person who can write grants and to uh, be a management consultant for nonprofits, uh, which I did for two or three years. And then I stumbled across a grant that I wrote for a customer that didn't want to do it because it involved going into the correctional system. Mm -hmm. Kind of interested me uh, because I've been doing training with the homeless and with populations that were low income and doing placement with them uh, for a long time. So I decided, well, I'll apply for this if you don't mind. I did and ended up getting it. So that's what started my career uh, in public safety uh, was back in the early, early 1990s. 
uh, with the first contract that we had, which was designed to go into the prison, work with the prisoners before they were released to prepare them better for the job market. And then they helped them get into jobs uh, once they had left the prison. So uh, the apple doesn't too, fall too far from the tree, I guess, is a saying about ancestry, but this is what's happened in my career. We've been doing the same type of job and same type of services over the years, but what we've done has been uh, redefined and transformed over the years to where it's now called reentry, uh, and that refers to the process of taking a person who's incarcerated or in institutionalized and providing them with a program of development that will assist them beginning before they leave uh, and then cross that transitional barrier to uh, continue assisting them in the community. So in doing that, we've come across a lot of different types of uh, services and needs that our clients that we serve uh, actually have provided to us. And uh, we discovered that many uh, of the services that are inside the facility that assist the, the uh, inmates the most to get out uh, involve programs that are mandated by the system for them to complete. Uh, so let me be clear about that. Uh, a, a, an inmate can reduce the time that they're serving by being a good inmate. Uh, and that's defined in several different ways. An obvious one would be if they're doing programs that improve themselves, then that usually will uh, allow for the parole board or their case managers, or the people in the prison to determine that they're doing a serious job of trying to rehabilitate on their own. So some of these programs that are mandated, of course you would think substance abuse, and that would be correct. Uh, substance abuse is a mandated program. Uh, sex offenders are uh, programmed very heavily uh, from the time they come in the facility beyond the time that they leave, if they leave at all uh, in that case. And then we have a specialty that's called uh, cognitive skills training that's done uh, with an approach called cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. Uh, this is something that I've had the fortunate circumstance of being trained in uh, since the mid-1990s, and I've uh, pursued it and developed it and incorporated that particular kind of uh, methodology into the way that we work with our prisoners right now in the prison population. And it's become what's called uh, best practice. So this is the way that uh, we use developmental programs to uh, meet the needs that our inmates have, both to be better uh, as they emerge and better prepared, but also to qualify them uh, by giving them services that will assist them in being able to uh, get out of the prison, showing that they have done something that's productive while they were in. Yes, can you tell us a little bit more about, uh, for people who don't know what CBT is, is cognitive behavioral therapy, um, but uh, how, how does that translate to how you work with the inmates? I mean, what is the objective when you're providing those, uh, that type of training for them? And how does that help them, you know, with their transition? Yeah, that's a very good question because uh, this is something that's been studied and uh, pretty, very consistently over the last 20 years, uh, along with parallel methodologies. But uh, let me make it uh, as simple as I can. Uh, when we're talking about uh, CBT, that those uh, initials um, in the psychology world actually stand for cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, and this is a type of uh, therapeutic approach uh, that's been promoted by people like Aaron Beck uh, and uh, others who are in uh, the field. And um, it's been appropriated mostly by people who may not be uh, trained in psychology, but are in change therapies or in treatment facilities or in prison or in uh, human development programs. And that CBT normally means cognitive behavioral training. Uh, so it's a slightly different application of the idea. The idea being that uh, people change when they have a motivation to change, and you can develop that motivation within the person 
by uh, letting the person come to a realization of the things that work best for them. Now, that's a fancy way of saying that what we do is kind of hold up a mirror to the individual. And uh, when that mirror is held up and you can see yourself, then um, we're asking or we're, we're expecting for two things to happen. Uh, by seeing yourself, you're going to see the things that you have been doing in your life. And you'll see both the things that you may have made mistakes in doing, and you'll see the things that may have helped you in the past. Well, what we want to do is we want to make that mirror reveal to the person the things that they can do to access that parts of them that have been successful. Uh, acknowledge the parts that need to have uh, work, and that work can be remedial work to, to fix things. It can be redemptive work to understand that the things I've done have harmed people, and uh, I have to address that also. It can be developmental work, where rather than looking back uh, and, and acting out of guilt, uh, as an example, we take that information and we turn it around and we look forward. And we put together plans that allow us to take advantage of the uh, particular strengths that we have and uh, at the same time address any of those, uh, I won't call them weaknesses, I would call them obstacles or barriers that we have to actually conquer. So mm -hmm. when we identify those things and we know what they are, oh, whoa! <laughs> Well, there goes the neighborhood. Okay. The so, joys of uh, Zoom and being at home. <laughs> <laughs> anything can happen around here. Look at 2020. That's what I expect. In 2020, <laughs> anything can happen. That's right. Um, so, yeah. So um, uh, I wanted to also focus and make sure that we have enough time to talk about uh, some of the local incarceration issues that we we have, um, you know, we have a fairly large Native Hawaiian population that is incarcerated here. I believe the st statistics are like around 30 percent. Oh, it's higher um, than that. Oh, it's higher than that? Yeah, it's higher than that. That may be uh, when we're looking at uh, people who are not totally identifying as Hawaiian but mixed uh, Polynesian or something. Mm -hmm. It's it's uh, in our experience uh, just over forty. Um, it's around there, so it's 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 pretty high. It's whatever way you want to slice it. It's shocking uh, and really unacceptable. So yeah. it's something that we have to do something about. Uh, we're going to need to take a short break. Um, I'm Ruby Menon, and this is Hawaii Reimagine on the Think Tech Live Streaming Network series. And we're talking with Chaz Williams from WorkNet about the services that his nonprofit provides for people transitioning from prison to the community to help them with the successful reentry process. We'll be back in a minute, so stay tuned for more of our story with Chaz Williams. We're back and we're live. I'm Ruby Menon, and this is Hawaii Reimagined on the Think Tech Live streaming network series. I'm talking with Chaz Williams, the executive director of WorkNet, and he runs an innovative nonprofit that provides preparation and transition services for people who are reentering their communities from prison. So uh, we had left off about some of the programs that you were providing uh, to 
the inmates and I believe that you were doing the training inside the prisons uh, during this time. You were providing the services inside the prisons as you were saying. Uh, but now we know with COVID, uh, a lot of people have had to pivot. And so uh, tell us a little bit about your pivot story, like what happened and how did you, how are you continuing to provide the services for the clients during this time? It's strange how things happen. And uh, when COVID hit, uh, around the first week of March, it uh, really began to be a, uh, a problem inside the correctional facilities, knowing that this may be a threat. Uh, the 20th of March, we were uh, banned. Uh, all programs pretty much were closed. And at that time, um, we were operating under a grant from the city and county, and uh, we had to produce. We, we were paid uh, only if we were training people and then producing people who were actually entering the community. And without being able to go in, we couldn't do that, so we were panicked. What happened was really, it was so funny and inspirational because um, I had applied for a PPP loan, one of the government loans that was so controversial small businesses couldn't get. We're about the smallest you can possibly be, but we were able to get one of those loans, but the loan required that we bring people off of unemployment and all of our staff was totally laid off because we had no work. So I had to bring people back uh, to actually qualify or else that uh, grant, the PPP money would turn from a loan to a grant. Uh, from, I'm sorry, from a grant to a loan. So we call people back from unemployment and we had no work inside the facility. So we decided, listen, we've got to find some way to get in contact with these inmates. So we wrote them and asked them if they would be interested in finishing the course. We had about uh, 27 uh, inmates, men and women, uh, that were being trained when COVID hit. So we were right in the middle of a training course when this happened to us. Well, the inmates that we wrote to responded and said, yes, uh, yeah, go ahead, send the stuff to us, and then we'll work on it, and you know, we'll see what we can work, work out. Well, that inspired us, and what uh, we did, we have a 48-hour, 24-course training program for uh, the cognitive behavioral training called Lifestyles, mm -hmm. and our Lifestyles program uh, at that time was allowing inmates to progress through the prison system and get trained and then move through the parole, which requires that they have this kind of training before being released. In doing that, uh, we, we uh, constructed our entire curriculum into correspondence workbooks. And we made our entire 48-hour curriculum into six uh, workbooks that we send out to the inmates directly that have answer sheets and other correspondence embedded in them uh, and then they send those back to us and they get credit uh, for achieving that particular uh, lesson. As long as they do it correctly and do it right. If they don't, then we will send the lesson back to them uh, so that they can uh, reconstruct it and then get the next lesson to proceed. So we've been working with the parole board and uh, also with the case management teams at the women's facility and at the Halawa facility to do this. And we're now, I can very proud, proudly say, uh, we're um, in looking at COVID, realizing that this is nothing that is anywhere near any of our control. And we really have, we must begin to realize that this situation that we're in may be semi-permanent. And what I mean by that, it's already lasted months, six months. And look at where we are. Uh, yeah. We're still in the shutdown after six months. Uh, the economists are not allowing us to think about that. So we have now decided this may be something we are doing as a matter of routine. So I think, uh, so, so what it sounds like to me is that you kind of went back to old school uh, correspondence style type of workbooks. And um, I was wondering if we could put up some photos because one of the things that I think is so unique about these workbooks is also that you have a resident artist uh, who uh, was formerly incarcerated, was one of your clients, and now is doing a lot of the artwork for these workbooks. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit more about that? I do. And, and 
Let me give a shout out to Mo Kalakai, who is our uh, staff artist, and to Sharon Thompson, who is our all around women specialist and our editor and researcher on the workbooks. Uh, all three of us have worked very hard on this, and I must give them a lot of the credit for it because they're the ones doing the human work. I'm just doing the writing and the editing and the publishing and that sort of stuff. But um, in coming together, I, actually, I can say uh, this was the perfect trio and the perfect blend of our talents to be able to create something that is meaningful. And our uh, best attestation that's coming from the uh, people we have in our classes right now who are saying that they're enjoying uh, of all things, the uh, the material, because at this point, we're the only people that can train because the lockout is still in effect for people who are training inside the correctional facilities. So uh, the innovation, I think, here is the fact that, as you were mentioning, we've gone backward in order to go forward. We have mm -hmm. taken something that's from 100 years ago in correspondence, and we've amalgamated that with uh, distance learning through Zoom. So at Halaba, we're sending out this material by mail. The inmates are receiving it and working on it and sending the material back to us. But we meet with them twice weekly on Zoom. And we go over not just the lessons because they're reading the lessons already. We're going over some of the concepts that are behind the lessons. And we're querying them about how they're using the material and uh, how it's affecting uh, their daily life and if it's being incorporated into what they do. So this is a great uh, vehicle for us to continue to work with them and to actually make this the kind of effort that has to be done uh, with an amalgamation of uh, people from not just our field and in the private sector and in the community, but we had a lot of cooperation uh, within public safety and parole uh, to do this and to pull it off. So I have to commend uh, the case management staffs at Halava and also at the women's facility uh, for the work that they do and how they have really helped and supported us. The learning centers also, uh, because our Zoom class is happening inside the learning center at Halava. It's a really wonderful experience to be able to do this and then to see the change that continues to happen because we are uh, touching these people in, a, in an effective way. Yeah, I, I I just find that so fascinating that, you know, everyone is having to go through this technology and it's it's leaving no one. There's no stone that's not on, you know, that's not turned. Right. I mean, everyone yeah. from school children now to inmates are having to do this virtual learning experience. And it's pretty fascinating that you've been able to to do this. I was wondering if we could put some more photos up because some of the artwork is really quite striking on the... Uh, yeah, that's uh, the cover of our yeah, um, assessment. That's the cover of our assessment uh, that we do for vocational and uh, risk and resilience for uh, inmates who are entering the job market. So uh, that's one of Mo's creations there mm -hmm. uh, that he's made for us. Uh, that's uh, an illustration that we have in one of our lessons where we're uh, giving the idea that when people are down and out, they're in a survival mode, maybe living on the street or close to it, uh, they would be tempted to actually choose things like drugs over food. Uh, mm -hmm. And we get our inmate population to examine that idea because some have been in that situation. Uh, where they've had to choose. Others have been in the situation where they've been the drug dealer mm -hmm. and they still had to have uh, to take responsibility for the things they're doing in society. So uh, that's part of the structure that we have. We have lively discussions about uh, the material itself. So it isn't just uh, reading the material and responding by doing the answer sheet. It's uh, how um, your life is being affected by the issues and the concepts that we're discussing and how you can take control of your life and then understand that you're not a victim as long as you take responsibility for what it is you're doing. Now you came up with a very interesting acronym for this program. You wanna tell us a little bit more about that and like what is it and how and what does it stand for? 
Yeah. And then we can also show some of the graphics that uh, mm -hmm. illustrate that. Yes, the, the program is called PCHAMP, but it's definitely an acronym. And it actually came from the impetus for this program itself. Uh, that stands for Pre-COVID Help and Mentoring Program. Pre-COVID, <laughs> I'm sorry, post-COVID. I'm giving you the opposite. Of what it, uh, it started pre-COVID because that's what it uh, initiated. Post-COVID mm -hmm. means that we're operating in um, a method that will allow us to continue to operate in spite of COVID being there. Mm -hmm. uh, the help that we're providing is in the form of the training and the development that we do. The mentoring happens in two different directions. Uh, the mentoring that we're talking about, we're, we're encouraging, now this is really something that is new. Uh, so when we send our material out, um, we're encouraging the people in the uh, institution that gets it to uh, hook up with the other people who are in the class with you. Now, we don't call it a class. We don't uh, refer to it that way. We refer to it as a team. And we refer to the person that is actually working with that team as a coach. And the material that's being sent back from the prison from each of the maybe 12 to 15 people in that class is going to one person, and that person is their coach, who scores, uh, communicates, uh, advises, um, and mentors that person. And they stick with them all the way from the time that we meet them in prison to the time that, pers that person's in the community and we're working with them. Now, the other way that uh, mentoring works in, in uh, addition to our professional people that are helping them in the community, they mentor themselves inside the institution by getting together and discussing among themselves the lessons that we're sending in, the concepts behind the lessons, so that as a team, they can work together so that people who we may usually have to uh, coach a little bit more because there may be some underlying issues that they have that they're working with. And by that, I mean, it may be a language barrier or it could be a, an educational barrier. It could be a cultural barrier. It could be things that they're dealing with where the reading uh, of the material uh, itself could be a challenge for them. So we encourage- um, Yeah. I'm sorry, but we're, we're coming to the end and I really wanted to talk about uh, helping inmates uh, transition and find jobs, but it looks like we're going to have to end here. Um, but thank you so much, Chaz, for telling us about the PCHAM program. And um, I just want to remind everyone that I'm Ruby Menon. This is Hawaii Reimagined on the Think Tech live streaming show. And uh, you can uh, get a hold of WorkNet if you'd like to learn more at www.worknetinc.org. And you can check out their website. And we've been talking with Chaz Williams, the executive director of WorkNet. And I'd like to thank everyone for being here. And uh, hopefully you'll tune back in next Wednesday or actually Wednesday, October 21st in two weeks at 3 p.m. We'll be talking to Alec Wagner, the director of the Purple Prize Innovation Incubator and Accelerator. And that should be a very interesting discussion about some of the awesome things that they're doing in the community. So until then, please be safe, be healthy, and be kind to one another. Aloha. <laughs>